Okay. Next picture. And this is a model that was given <coughs> as a part of the final exam last year. And the students felt that it was very difficult. And do you know why? Because they <coughs> hadn't read this chapter good enough. <laughs> now we have a different case. So this is a case. And now it concerns trade. <coughs> Somebody will have to help me. <coughs> Soon the picture will come. <coughs> now, instead of two players, Airbus and Boeing, we introduce a third player. That is a national player <coughs> that will move first. And the decision that this national player moving first can take is to subsidize its own industry. So this is <coughs> to go into a game where the countries are player. So we have no a US market and <coughs> Boeing is produced in US and is bought by companies in US while Airbus the number of airplanes from Airbus will be imported to US so now we have international trade and the question is, could it be a good strategy for a country to play the subsidy game or, or to play the tariff game or to try to protect its own industry by different kind of protection instead of free trade? So now we introduce a country as a player concerning trade. And <coughs> we have, as we have seen before, we have Boeing and Airbus, and they play. And we know the solution when they play without subsidies. Now US decides that I think the national advisor would say that to subsidize our own industry with three dollars per unit can be profitable. And some economists have sat down and they have discovered that mm, this can be smart. What happens? Simple. When 
we change the reaction function for Boeing. We start with Boeing at the left hand side of the equation, the residual demand function, and <coughs> twice as the proof. Instead of equal to 10, it's equal to 7. Equal to 7. Then Boeing will have a shift in the reaction function outwards. And instead of producing 30, would produce 32. And Airbus, instead of producing 30, would produce 29. Because we will have a new Nash agreement. So this is the change in Nash agreement. Then we find the consumer surplus. And if you don't find it in the new textbook, that is because the authors have dropped everything concerning trade. And I will reintroduce that. So the text from the old textbook will be sent to you. <coughs> and and you will find it in Fronta. Okay. <coughs> then what do we do next? We see what happens with the consumer surplus before the subsidy. The gray area here is consumer surplus. But when the price will go down to 39, the quantity up to 61, for the US consumers, the consumer surplus will increase. Mm. See that? <coughs> and when they produce 32 units, with the price 39, and <coughs> the marginal cost is only <coughs> 7. We end up with Boeing having a much higher profit. And then the government have paid subsidies equal to 3 multiplied with <coughs> 32. And if we add <coughs> consumer surplus, producer surplus, and subsidies, we end up in a solution where U.S. will earn <coughs> from subsidies. Totally, they will have a social benefit just by subsidizing. Because by subsidizing Boeing, Boeing will capture a higher market share. And through that higher market share, you both have a higher consumer surplus and a higher profit. And that more and compensate for the subsidies. So this is a literature <coughs> that came up 25 years ago. And the story could be told that why come countries don't do that? Why don't US just subsidize? Because this model tells us that it's a win again. And so to say, this is a case when the first mover advantage. Move first. Introduce subsidies and you will gain. 
but in praxis if you do that what will France do? then France will take a counter move and <coughs> if they subsidize their industry it was maybe even more <coughs> they go all the way down to the subsidy level of four then US <coughs> has a subsidy level of seven and in the final exam the question was how much will they lose and that is not difficult because if both subsidize then <coughs> they will both lose so if this will be a start up of a trade war where they both play subsidies then they will both be losers. But if one will play, <coughs> and that <coughs> will not <coughs> end in a counter move, then you have a first ball advantage. <coughs> so to be smart, move first, and, <coughs> and wait for a counter move. And once you have a counter move, then travel to, to France and say, and stop here <coughs> and go back to zero subsidies. <coughs> was that okay? Or was it difficult? none want to sign a contract and, and they don't trust each other you have a problem and of course that's why we have this World Trade Organization WTO that try to stop these kind of trade wars <coughs> and in the fi final exam, <coughs> there is one model to add to this, and that is a model where we introduce entry. When entry is easy, it's much more difficult to have to capture any welfare gains from these trade wars. And, and the next model, next picture, <coughs> that is from this nice Japanese market <coughs> where we start with <coughs> a model with two. Japanese companies, two US companies producing uh, TVs, televisions. Four companies, they have exactly the same production technology. The marginal cost is 20. And the fixed cost in the textbook is 256. And when there are four companies here, because of entry is easy, it's always when we have monopolistic competition, the price level will be exactly enough to cover the long run average cost with no extra profit and monopolistic competition has that dimension 
that if there will be anything like profit, there will be a newcomer that will enter and eliminate profit. So the price level always will exactly cover the marginal cost and the fixed cost. So when it comes to startup, the total quantity is 64. The price is 36. And the companies earn zero profit. So the social economic benefit is only the consumer surplus. 100 minus 36, that is 64, multiplied with 64, divided on 2. 64 multiplied with 64, divided on 2, that is the gray triangle. That's where they start. Then suddenly, the Japanese government finds out. We want to be smart. We subsidize our industry with $16 per unit. $16 per unit. Then we move all the way down from 36 to 20, new price level. And instead of 64, now five companies will come up, but only Japanese, only Japanese companies. No US companies. Why come? Because they don't earn money. And since the Japanese government subsidized them heavily, there will come up three new companies because entry here is easy. It's not very difficult to produce television. With the same technology, we know of five companies. None of them capture any profit. They exactly cover the margin and the fixed cost. So now we have the problem in an economy <coughs> where entry is easy. Now to the conclusion. What will be the extra consumer surplus for the country that will subsidize heavily? The red area. That will be the increase in consumer surplus. <coughs> what will be the cost? The cost is the total subsidies. That is the black triangle, the black rectangle. Because they subsidies e subsidize each unit with $16, they produce 80. So you can easily see that the black area is bigger than the red one. Therefore, this strategy to move first in an economy with a monopolistic competition, trying to subsidize their own industry, was not a good strategy. So once the market has changed from a Kono game to a game where you play under monopolistic con competition, the conclusion changed. And therefore, what you have learned so far, it's very, very important to understand what kind of game are these players playing. If they play a Kono game, then there is a first war advantage. If they play under a regime 
a monopolistic competition, don't move first. And I had the same lecture for last year students at approximately the same time. But when they came to the final exam, this model was difficult. So they sent me a complaint after the final exam, telling me that it was a very, very difficult exam. And I said, don't worry. It was maybe a little bit, a little bit more difficult than what you're used to. But at the end, it was a very good class. And 10 out of 40 students got an A. <laughs> 10 out of 40. Even with this model, when they dealt with a third player, a country playing over subsidies. <coughs> okay. <laughs> so, I just remind you that today you have seen some models that might be a little bit more difficult <coughs> than what you have seen so far. But it will be even more difficult later on. So just keep on going. <laughs> so this was playing the international trade game. Next picture. Now, finally, the nice stackable game. <coughs> Can you see what this is? Yep. It's a decision tree. So far, we have played a simultaneous game. They play over quantity simultaneously, and we have imperfect information meaning that each player don't know exactly what the other player has, has done before moving. Now, we change the model into a model with perfect information. And Airbus, just imagine that Airbus has a first mover advantage. <coughs> Airbus starts. What if I play 20? Then Airbus will say that if I play 20, I just put 20 into Boeing's reaction function, and Boeing will play 35. And I will have a profit of 700, and Boeing. 1225. And then Airbus will say, if I play 30, that's an actual equilibrium. Boeing will play 30. They will both have 900-900. Come over again. And Airbus will see, if I play 40, and I put 40 into the reaction function. Boeing will play 25. And Airbus will see that. Mm, now I have 1,000. And Boeing only 625. So Airbus will say that this is smart. And will go all the way down to playing 45. If he puts 45 into the reaction function for Boeing, Boeing will be forced to play 22.5, giving 
inverse 10 12.5 and it's not difficult here in this decision tree to see that backward induction Airbus just looks at knows exactly what Boeing will do because Airbus has Boeing's reaction function and Airbus will know that Boeing always will move along its reaction function and then Airbus by backward induction easily see that 10-12 is the best solution I can have so Airbus plays 45 and definitely this was the first mover advantage so what we have learned so far when you merge don't move first if you play the subsidy game, move first. And if you play over quantity, you have, when you play the Kono game, a first mover advantage. Move first. Can you repeat this? Huh? In a Kono game, when you play over quantity, you don't merge, there will be no first mover advantage by merging. If you play as a country and there is a Cornwall game and you try to analyze whether to move first, subsidize your own industry, move first. And if Airbus just recognize, see this picture, know that they play they play the Kono game. Airbus will definitely understand that move first is a good strategy. And just to remind you, because it is a Kono game. If it is a bad whole game that we will play later on, you don't move first. But when you have understood that it is a bad whole game, a Kono game, <coughs> and just to remind you, what is it that tells us that this is a Kono game? That is when the two players or all the players have no excess capacity. There will be no extra capacity. And they play over prices utilizing exactly all capacity. So when there will be no excess capacity, they play over prices with no excess capacity and they earn money somewhere in between perfect competition and the monopoly then you definitely play the Kono game hmm? that is the Kono game <coughs> and <coughs> analytically why come was the solution 45? <coughs> Next picture. This is the easy way to show it. We start with the residual demand function. P equal to 100 minus QB minus QA and then that is equal to 
100 minus minus and then we put the reaction function for QB into the residual demand function and the reaction function for QB is 45 minus half QA so what Airbus achieves is to put the pressure on Boeing <coughs> forcing Boeing to respond along its best reaction function and analytically then you just find that now P is equal to 55 minus half QA and then we use twice as the improve Modular revenue is 55 minus QA and we put that equal to 10 and then QA is 45 so simple <coughs> so what you need to understand is <coughs> that <coughs> the residual demand function that's where you start and since Airbus moves first you start with the residual demand function for Airbus <coughs> and you put the reaction function for Boeing into the residual demand function for Airbus and then <coughs> we found 55 minus half QA then the twice as steep road modern revenue putting that equal to modern cost and QA equal to 45 and this is Nash agreement none of the players will have any incentives to change once this game has been played out so Airbus just just force Boeing into producing less by moving first just force Boeing producing less by moving first so Boeing is just reducing capacity <coughs> wasn't that the nice one analytically again I can tell you that you just need to be familiar with just this analytical way of finding a solution to the Stackenberg game so just go home and train <coughs> and again we always use these models to look for changes what if Airbus or Boeing will change the cost playing over logistics if one of them <coughs> succeed to play over logistics finding a new modern cost how will that change the solution next picture no Boeing reaction function instead of 10 is 11. What happens if 
bowing is less productive one ambush is more efficient now bowing will have a new reaction function <coughs> now bowing's reaction function is 44.5 minus half Q A. So there is a shift in Boeing's <coughs> reaction function. And then <coughs> we see that we go through the same analytical process. <coughs> if you go down to 817, <coughs> we, we start with the <coughs> procedure demand function and <coughs> we put the new reaction function into AMS residual demand function and we end up <coughs> using the twice as t pool again we <coughs> end up that Airbus, instead of reducing 45, this change, <coughs> and it's only a marginal change, ends up in Airbus producing 45.5. <coughs> so, to change the cost structure, when we give changes, shifts in the reaction function, and when the reaction function changes, the Nash equilibrium will change. Instead of 45, Airbus produce 45.5. <coughs> so this is the Steckelberg game. Move first. <coughs> <coughs> Now, we start with the last model. Now we have played the Kono model. <coughs> we have a monopolistic competition. We have, we have had the stackable again. And finally, <coughs> it is the Batron game. And <coughs> next picture. What characterizes a bad home game? What you need to know is the big difference between the Kono game and the bad home game is that when you play the bad home game, the players always have capacity to capture the entire market. <coughs> so if the players out there always have idle capacity, always can increase capacity very fast, for instance in the airline industry, if they just can lease new airplanes, if it's easy to hire people, they can increase capacity very fast. And if they always can act as if they can capture the entire market, <coughs> then you have a battle game. Because in a market with excess capacity, all the players want to capture a higher market share because they can easily expand. Then they start underbidding each other. All the way down to marginal cost. Why 
Why come? Why come? Because Nash agreement will tell you that if your rival has a price that will be marginally higher than yours, you just underbid the margin and capture the entire market. So in a market with homogeneous product, where there will be <coughs> excess capacity, you might easily end up in a battle game where none of the players earn any extra profit, and they will have no money left for covering fixed costs. <coughs> Let's see one example how this market can be illustrated within the airline industry. <coughs> one, one player here is called S. The other player is called V, and these are our <coughs> <coughs> connections between two cities. <coughs> Each of these players has many planes available because they are big companies, <coughs> and they can always capture the entire market between these two cities. <coughs> and then they know <coughs> that if they put the prices just equal to each other, <coughs> they will <coughs> split the market in into two. <coughs> and the total market here it's Q equal to a thousand minus phi. And if so Southwest will put its price only margin higher than yours, then they will produce nothing. If the price level will be marginally below, they capture the entire market. And if the price level will be exactly the same, they split the market into two. So this is if the consumers just select that company with the lowest price, and definitely you do that, you choose that company with the lowest price, then this is a realistic market. Then it was a way. <coughs> and we take the rest after the break. <coughs> <coughs>